Good morning, and hopefully this is the last time I will be coming to you from the pulpit at Riverside Presbyterian Church in Jacksonville. I plan to make my trek to Birmingham uh, this coming Wednesday and start the process of acclimating myself uh, to your great church and to Birmingham itself. So with this last sermon from this pulpit, it also it was the last sermon that I preached uh, before my retirement from this church almost a year ago. There's something completely fitting about the circle of that movement. Today's passage is what's known as Pentecost passage. It's one of the two passages in the New Testament preached year after year. Uh, the first, of course, is Christmas, Luke story of the birth of Mary, and the second one is Luke's story in Acts of the Pentecost experience for the beginning of the church with the coming of the Holy Spirit. Last week's sermon, if you listened or watched, was about Jesus ascending into heaven to sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, leaving his disciples sort of in a lurch Wondering what to do next, they were indeed afraid and anxious, having been left alone. And Jesus said to them, his last words, in fact, as to the time of what will come, you do not know the time. Timing is God's business. What you'll get instead is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be able to to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Now, turn the page. In this morning's passage, we find the 11 disciples, not including Judas, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus, some other women, all told, Luke says in Acts, there were 120 of them gathered together huddling really behind the closed door in the safe sanctuary of the upper room, having no idea what to do next, only that Jesus told them to wait and to pray, that something called the Holy Spirit would come. Listen now to the Word of God as it is given to us in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and may the Holy Spirit come to us with an understanding of this word. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. This is the version of the Bible known as the message. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through the ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. Now, there were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. And when they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking in our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others cynically joked, they're just filled with cheap wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me start with a disclaimer. This is not the sermon I intended to preach yesterday. In fact, I had pretty much 
written, uh, sweet little, I think, even funny discourse on this Pentecost moment until yesterday at lunch I had three successive phone calls from independent church members telling me some things and some hurt and some hopes for what would come in the next year or two or three for this wonderful church in Birmingham. And after those conversations, I think it was the Holy Spirit that came down into me and said, you know what, Steve, that sermon ain't going to do it. What you need is to start over. And so I did. And the disclaimer is I really haven't had much time to know it. So bear with me. Ultimately, I've always thought this story about the Pentecost experience is the coolest thing in the world, a bunch of frightened believers, Jesus' disciples, are scared behind closed doors in the upper room, not knowing what to do, waiting and praying for the Spirit to come upon them and give them the ability to make them able to get back on their feet and get back out into the world and be the witnesses of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as they were called and told to do. And we don't know how long they were huddled up in that room. Liturgically, it was only 10 days from the day of ascension 10 days later to the Pentecost moment. Pentecost is about the Jewish Feast of Booths, 50 days after the first day of Passover. That's where the word comes from. But we really don't know. Luke doesn't tell us exactly how long they were huddled in that room. All I know, I think I know, is that they were there long enough to finally come together in the same place. No telling how many arguments and discussions it took them to get there. Who's going to lead us? What exactly is our mission? Who's going to be included in this kingdom of God anyway? Just Jews? Everybody? It probably sounded like one of those seemingly never-ending session meetings when something important is on the table to discuss and vote on. Like, what kind of music will we be allowed to play in the sanctuary? Or even more poignant and close, who are we going to allow to use it. The story in the King James Version says that they were all together in one accord, and they're not talking about a Honda automobile, they're talking about being together in a sense of union, but it doesn't say what they were in accord about. And, and I think, I'm guessing, that they were in accord about the fact that they were not able to work these things out. They were in accord about the fact that they disagreed. Someone suggested they hire a consultant, but that finally got squashed because A, they didn't have enough money for it, and B, weren't they in fact the ones who were called to be Jesus' consultants to the world after all? So they were deadlocked. And all they could do was what Jesus told them to do, which was to wait and to pray. In the early 1960s at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, which was my church for 15 years before I came to Riverside Church, it was coincidentally a Northern Presbyterian Church, just like Independent Presbyterian Church was before reunion in the early 80s. And in the, the 1960s, the days of of integration or segregation, the question came up about whether they would allow African Americans to come into the church to worship. Some said yes, some said no. Many of the ushers, in fact, had said no, they would not sit them. They were afraid that the black folks would come because they wanted to make a protest statement. 
And to be honest, some were just racist. They say that session meeting lasted for hours, deep into the night and early morning. The pastor, Dr. Herman Turner, also coincidentally was a deep, close friend and cut from the same cloth as Dr. Henry Edmonds, the amazing founding pastor of Independent Presbyterian Church. And Dr. Turner, who was called to be the moderator of that session, sat patiently making sure they followed the Robert's rules of order decently and in order as long as it took for them to figure out they were stymied. Finally, when everyone had been given time to speak, knowing that they were heard, Dr. Turner handed the gavel of the moderatorship to his associate and said to them, if the ushers will not seat our Negro brothers, the word they used in those days, this is, this is written down precisely as he said in the minutes, will not seat our Negro brothers, that's their choice. They are still part of this church. Both the ushers and the Negro brothers and sisters, if they want to be. But every elder in this room, as you were ordained to be in the name of Jesus Christ, will walk over to our black visitors and introduce yourselves and invite them to sit down beside you during worship. It was as if, at that point, everything was now settled. And they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the words of Herman Turner, were forced to get out of their safe little places and go out and be like Jesus. Not everyone agreed, of course. Some people left the church over it. Many later came back confessing that looking back, they were wrong and that something holy had happened even though they didn't like it at first. The story in this morning's text is that when it was finally time, those 120 disciples heard a sound like the blue angels overhead, leaving sparks and flames from their exhaust falling on them like tongues of fire. And it was such a spiritually powerful moment that they all finally came together as one after the coming of the Spirit, then going out of their safe little sanctuary space into the world to lead every single person gathered outside for Pentecost to hear the word of God's love for all people, even though they were of different races and creeds, and nationalities, and politics. I just can imagine them dancing out the door so full of the Spirit they couldn't stop their feet from moving. Pentecostal-like, hands up in the air. I mean, they would be embarrassing for Presbyterians. They were so filled with the power of the Spirit and the gift of tongues, glossolalia it's called, so filled with that power that they found these gifts of communication in a way that they were able to talk and speak to those with a different language so that they were heard and listened to. A common language. That's what tongues do when the Spirit moves. It's not ba 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 babble babble that no one knows what you're talking about. It is about this moment when you have this conversation with someone, a dialogue where you are actually listening to what they say and they are listening to you and something new happens. And, and Luke wants us to know how powerful this moment was that he lifts up all the names of those gathered. I won't read them all. Parthians, Medes, Elamite, Elamites, uh, Mesopotamians, da, 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 da. And what we don't know is that many of the nations that he lists were extinct at the time of this writing. They didn't exist hundreds of years before 
sometimes a thousand years before they had been made extinct by a conquering army, the Elamites. They had long since been gone. The Phygians and the Pamphyleans, they didn't exist. Not now. The story is so clear that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it cuts through all of the constraints and barriers and defenses that keep us apart, even time and space. Everyone gathered in community, even though chronologically it was impossible. Do we get this? Do we get this kind of power? Different races, different eras, different languages, Republicans and Democrats, every race, creed, nationality, preference, right to lifers and right to choice, McConnell and Schumer, Pelosi and Trump even, possibly, all together hearing each other with one voice in sync, no longer playing or tweeting their politics of hate and blame and division. Oh my God, come Lord Holy Spirit. Man. As followers of Jesus, tired and ashamed deep down of our stupid divisions and our scapegoating and our blaming, where and how can we find this kind of power now? I can tell you I felt personally many times like those disciples in some of my own personal relationships, afraid, defensive, protecting myself, not having the right words to say, don't know what to do next, just sort of waiting for something to happen. I'm powerless, I'm not able, I'm just not able. It's a feeling of impotence. Did you know that the word power, in fact, comes from the Latin word passe, which means to be able, to be able. If anything is true about those disciples and us, it is that when it comes to some things that separate us, they, we are just not able to reconcile. We are left powerless in the face of some things that we cannot agree on. The Bible has a word for it. The Bible calls them demons. Paul calls them the powers and principalities that separate us. Nothing will separate us from the love of God, Paul says, not even the powers and principalities. And the point is that whatever it is that separates us from God or from our neighbors and even from ourselves is in some way, according to the Bible, demonic. There's this wonderful story in Mark's gospel right after the story of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus comes back down with three of his disciples to find the other nine disciples left standing there on some little road huddled around this convulsive boy trying to do something, but they couldn't. They were not able, they had no power. And the story says that the boy had this demon spirit in him that required exorcism. Earlier, the disciples had been given the power of, to, ex to, to, to perform exorcism as they were sent out. But now, for some reason, they were clueless. They, they were not able, they did not have the power. They were left whispering to each other like physicians in the old, old days before antibiotics when faced with pneumonia. We don't know what to do. They weren't able. And sooner or later, of course, we all come to that place, faced with the dark powers like this where we are not able. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we are not able to outpower it. While at the same time, empower our economy, at least for now. 
How many of us have faced those dark and difficult times of I'm not able? A spouse with an incurable disease, a child with a disability, some personal hardship or heartache we cannot fix. Will Campbell, in his profound book, A Brother to a Dragonfly, about the amazing power of God's grace, tells of Will Campbell's, it's his biography, his autobiography, tells of his attempt to heal and rescue his brother who was a druggist by trade, but a drug addict by practice. And no matter what Will tried to do, everything he tried to save him, church and friends and doctors and psychiatrists and family and pleading to no avail, Will was not able. And he came to see that only if and when his brother was able to see that he was not able to, that he was powerless in the face of his addiction, nothing would happen. So back to the story in Mark, in this exorcism, Mark says that Jesus comes down upon them and he's frustrated and he says, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? Bring the boy to me. And then when it was time, of course, when it was the right time, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, said, You dumb and deaf spirit, I command you out of him and never enter him again. And then all were able. Later that night, his disciples, confused why they didn't have that power, and Jesus did, asked Jesus why they couldn't cast it out. And Jesus' response was so simple that we almost oversee it. We, we miss it. We don't take it seriously. He, Jesus says, this kind of power cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Prayer? Prayer? Does it? Not power, not remedies, not science, not politics, not religion, just prayer? Ah, oh, now we get it, of course. Remember when he told them after the ascension and left them alone to go back to Jerusalem and wait and pray? And then you will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, then be able. It is that point where we are left with only prayer to offer that we will discover that what is impossible for us is possible for God. Now, I have to confess that this is not easy for us in our can-do society, that in some things we are not able and impotent, especially against these demonic powers and principality, does not make us happy. We are the do-it, the, the get-it-done people. We're taught from the beginning success is about power, accessing it, using it, even bludgeoning people with it. And it's played out every year, as we know, in the Iron Bowl. And the point is that, that we think that the point of life is to build this foundation of power to stand on, a strong enough foundation to bring us success through our own devices and our hard work. When it comes to when it comes to healing the kind of demonic powers that Jesus is talking about, our hard work only makes it worse. That we are impotent against some of this demonic stuff that splits us apart. We sometimes cannot fix it. And that, you see, is our hope. There's a new book, well, relatively new book for David Brooks, the prolific writer uh, that we read in the New York Times and maybe see on the NPR network at night on Friday nights called The Second Mountain. And he explains in this 
that what is really at stake when we think about power this way is, is really to understand life like a two-story or a two-mountain world, two mountains, sort of a, a U-curve, each, each top of the U being one mountain, the other top being the second mountain. And he says that when you get out of school and begin a career and start a family, you identify the first mountain and think that that's the one I'm meant to climb. I'm going to be a cop or a doctor or a preacher or an entrepreneur or business person. And on the first mountain, all we have to do is to perform the certain tasks, life's tasks, and establish this ego identity and separate from our parents and cultivate our talents and build a secure sense of self and try to make a mark in this world. And it's called people climbing. And it's about that first mountain rising up into the mountain of power to spend our time there thinking that we have a reputation to manage. And they, we are always keeping score and asking, how do I measure up? Or do I rank? That's first mountain. Then something happens. Some people get to the top and discover that the first mountain of success is tasteless. It's unsatisfying. It doesn't fill their souls. Is this all there is? And so they wonder and they wander down. Other people get knocked off the mountain by some failure or something happens in their career, their family, their reputation. For still others, something unexpected happens that knocks them crossways, the death of a child or a cancer scare. Whatever, these people are no longer on the mountain, the first mountain, and all they can do down in the valley of bewilderment is grieve and wait and hope and pray. Hopefully there they will discover another layer of themselves that they have neglected, Brooks says, a substrate where the dark wounds and most powerful yearnings in us live. Some shrivel in the face of this kind of suffering. They seem to get more afraid and resentful. They shrink away from their inner depths in fear. Their lives become smaller and lonelier. We all know people who nurse eternal wounds and grievances. They don't get the respect they deserve. They say they live their lives as an endless tantrum about some wrong done to them long ago. They refuse to come down off the first mountain. But for others, this valley is the making of them. Brooks says, they see deeper into themselves there and realize that, that, that down in that substrate, flowing from all the tender and vulnerable places where they are powerless, there is a fundamental ability to care, a yearning to transcend themselves, ourselves, and care for others. And when they, we have encountered this yearning, we and they are ready to become the whole person up on the second mountain. This is hard to hear when we have built our lives on first mountain power. The United States, I think, in part has been built on this kind of first mountain power. We are the greatest, we are the biggest, we are the richest, we are the most powerful nation on earth. And now, rendered by the effect of the powerlessness caused by the epidemic, the United States, the greatest power on earth, is not able to fix it any more than any other power. Independent Presbyterian Church has this kind of power. Look at these buildings, the status of the church, the wealth, the membership, the incredible gifts in this church, its reputation, its music program, its history, its leaders, the staff. Generationally, IPC has had this kind of power. But now, you, we have recently discovered that this first mountain power will not fix us. And that we have come to a logjam like last fall 
when this church lost two of the most loved and dear members back to back, and then finding ourselves in a spat over who can use the sanctuary and who cannot, or what the Bible says or doesn't say about it. So by God's grace, I think, Independent Presbyterian Church has been pushed off the first mountain of worldly power into the valley where we are not able. So now all we can do is wait and pray for the reconciling Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ to come and empower us again. Don't despair. According to this passage, this is exactly where Jesus wants us to be. Huddled together, trying to work things out, even though we do not agree, this is the place where we learn to give up our egos and our wants, our righteousness and our sanctimoniousness. These first mountain idolatries, give them up and wait in the valley for the Spirit to come to us and make us able once again to climb up together as one body of reconciliation, forgiveness, and love. And when this happens, it's called Pentecost. And it looks like the church, being the church, and all are included, even those who've come and gone. Let's remember, however, that not everyone wants this. In today's passage, after the spiritual power came and and connected all of these nations together in one voice, the passage ends with some cynics standing by, scoffing at them, saying they're just drunk on cheap wine. And in a way, ironically, they're right. They are drunk on wine. Drunk on the wine that is the most powerful drink of all from the cup of reconciliation and forgiveness. But it was not cheap. It cost Christ his life. It was not cheap. Pray. And wait, he told them. When it's time, the power will come without which we are not able. Amen.